Good evening and welcome everyone. I'm George Mariner Mall, Artistic Director of the Discovery Orchestra and your host for this evening's Classical Conversation. The Discovery Orchestra teaches the listening skills that help people really connect emotionally with classical music. And if you're already connected, which I assume most of you are, I hope that our time spent together will deepen that connection. The Discovery Orchestra reaches audiences through our media programs, Discovery Chat videos on YouTube, our Emmy-nominated Discovery concerts distributed by American Public Television, and our radio show, Inside Music, produced by WWFM 89.1, the classical network in Princeton, and heard worldwide on the web. Our public television shows may also be streamed free of charge by Prime members on Amazon.com. And three of these, three of these shows can be watched on NJPAC in your living room, uh, a page on the website of NJPAC under the tab, Learn Something. We hope you'll visit the Discovery Orchestra's website at discoveryorchestra.org. And while there, check out our Learn at Home page. If you'd like to ask any questions this evening, we'll take some time to do that before the final playthrough of the Chopin Scherzo. At that time, just push the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen, type in your questions, and I'll answer as many as I can. Frederick Franciszek Chopin, as they say in Poland, shown there in the next to last image in a daguerreotype of him looking so much older than his 39 years when he died of complications of tuberculosis. But what an incredible musical legacy he created during his brief life. The music playing under the collage of images of him was his prelude in D-flat major, always sure to touch our hearts. But this evening, we're going to focus on another of his compositions, originally scheduled to be performed today at NJPAC by pianist Xiong Jin Cho, the scherzo number no. two in B flat minor, opus 31. Chopin wrote four scherzos, and of them, number no. two is perhaps the most popular. We're going to listen to it twice this evening, once without prior comment, and once after we've explored it together. So here is Xiong Jin Cho performing the scherzo number no. two during the 17th International Chopin Competition in Warsaw in 2017, which he won, propelling him into his highly successful career. <laughs>
I first want to remind you that the word scherzo in Italian literally means joke. And musical scherzos, whether they be in a movement in a symphony or chamber music work or a solo composition for the piano, tend to be lively, in triple meter, and often somewhat humorous. Keep that in mind as we explore this music, as well as when we listen to the entire scherzo again at the end of the session. In terms of its overall structure, this scherzo is in ternary or three-part form, which we can designate by the letters A, B, A. And just to prove to me that you can easily detect when the music is returning to the part A, I'm going to first start the music at the opening of part A, then jump to near the end of part B, and finally ask you to make some physical gesture when you notice that the music of part A has resurfaced. But regarding this physical gesture, which I'll request of you a number of times this evening, this can be as simple as raising a finger or your eyebrows, as long as you physically respond in some way. And since you're in the privacy of your own home, no one will be watching you. So assuming everyone understands the assignment, here's the opening music of part A. Well, I didn't see any eyebrows or fingers raised when part A returned. Of course, I can't really see your eyebrows or fingers during this Zoom webinar, but truth is, I hope that no one detected the return of part A due to the fact that I played the wrong music for you on purpose. Instead of the music being near the return uh, part A in the scattered so, I played music near the return of part A of Chopin's A-flat major polonaise, a piece of music possibly familiar to you, but definitely not the scherzo number two. And the reason I did this is at the Discovery Orchestra, we want to help people have an awareness, an aha, if you will, around whether they are really listening to music or just hearing it while they think about or do other things. Electronically reproduced music is everywhere we go in our society the supermarket, the waiting room, behind almost every visual image on TV or at the movies. We've actually been trained to ignore music as sonic wallpaper. To test this sometime in the future after the pandemic, when you find yourself in a restaurant, without warning, ask someone at your table if they enjoyed the last piece of music that was played over the sound system in the restaurant and if they can identify it. Don't be surprised if they respond, is there music on? And to make matters worse, even when people think they are listening, that is, giving the music their complete and undivided attention, as in when they attend concerts, many people actually tune out for periods of time. Really? You say? Yeah, really. They may stop listening for a moment to check out an attractive concert goer in the next row, or, feeling bored, they may resort to reading the contributors list in the program, thinking to themselves, wow, the Andersons gave that much money to MJ Pack? <laughs> so what's the problem with this? Unlike songs, abstract pieces of music with no words are nevertheless written by composers like discourses. Each sound is connected like a thought, one to the next. And if we miss some information while our attention is diverted to reading the program notes, we will not receive the full impact of the music. Chopin intended for us to listen to every musical sound from the beginning all the way to the end. People do things in concerts they would never dream of doing at a play or a movie. Would we, for instance, consciously tune out, say, for several minutes of dialogue and then hope to be able to understand what's happening next in the first act? But at a concert, 
If we start thinking about all the things we forgot to buy at the supermarket or begin to rehash in our minds some disagreeable confrontation we had with our boss, spouse, or child, we could miss the entire first movement of a Chopin piano concerto. So pardon my sermon, I won't give it again, and I won't engage in any more pranks, but I give you this thought. If we decide to give abstract wordless music our total attention, we will be greatly rewarded. Okay, once again, the opening of the scherzo's part A, followed by the end of part B and the return of part A, acknowledge A's return with some physical gesture. I knew that you could do that easily, especially since you're now all keenly aware of the difference between listening to music and just hearing it as a background to other thoughts and activities. Now, let's take a deeper dive into part A and part B. Each of these two sections has three distinct themes. If you've downloaded the listening guide from the NJPAC website or, or not, uh, just look at number one, or if you haven't done this, just follow along on the screen. When the music is played, you'll see things there to follow. We're in part A and we see there theme one, soft impish questions, fortissimo chords answer. Here is one of those events. My question to is, how many of these events are there? Count the first paired event as one, then you're on your own. So how'd you do? Hopefully you counted four of those events. And truth is Chopin would actually like us to perceive them as two pair of two events. And each pair of questions and answers is demarcated by something funny. You may recall my mentioning that scherzo in Italian means joke. Listen to theme one again as two pair of two events and see if you detect the humorous delineation. For me, it's the loud, short note at the end of each pair da -da, that sounds so humorous. I'll start the music just a little before the loud, short note. It's like um, a little kick in the derriere.
Look at number two in the listening guide, or again, just follow along on screen when the music starts. We have theme two, a capricious, almost bipolar musical idea. First, it speeds up, then it suddenly slows down a bit. It starts very loud, but gets suddenly soft. And it's incredibly short. If you blink, you'll miss it. Have a listen. Now, perhaps because it's so short, Chopin presents it to us more than once. Count the number of times it occurs here. And that would be a total of two times. But are they identical? And now we separate the sheep from the goats in listener land. Listen very carefully. And no, they are not identical in both hands. As theme two ends, the right hand plays a similar idea each time, but not the left hand. The first time, the left hand plays six soft chords. The second time, the left hand plays an imitation of the right hand. Listen to just those two different endings. I know that goes by incredibly fast. Listen for the left hand again in those two different endings side by side. One, two, three, four, five, six. And da 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 In case you're wondering about the image of Chopin we're using to separate live from recorded segments tonight, it was created by Persian 3D artist Hadi Karimi, who used Chopin's death mask to fashion this image. Well, let's look at part A, theme three. Out of the blue, we get this beautiful, uplifting theme. We'll listen to it twice in a row. In your listening guide at number three, it says that theme three is presented in ascending sequence. A sequence in music is a repetition that changes altitude, either up or down. So, repetition. Da 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 Ascending sequence. Da 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 Descending sequence. Da 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 So my listening assignment for you, counting the first occurrence as step one, how many ascending steps are in this sequence involving theme three before I stop the music? Does everybody understand the assignment? Here we go. How many ascending steps did you find? Three, I hope. If for, if for some reason it's challenging to notice these things, not to worry. I assure you, if you listen this carefully to music on a regular basis, it will get easier and easier to notice details and more importantly, to enjoy those details 
as they occur in real time. Listen once again, and we'll put a visual on screen to verify each step of the sequence as it occurs. <laughs> After that ascending sequence, theme three is reiterated in part, and then we have a stimulating crescendo or getting louder, and then we arrive at number four, the listening guide, the closing section, a musical passage that communicates to us, I'm closing this out because I'm going to do something else now. These arpeggiated, broken chords of the closing section excite our senses. I'm going to start the music at number three in the listening guide. Let it play through number four, and then ask you to fill in the blanks at number five, where it says, after the dramatic silence or rest, the music repeats from number blank to number blank. And we found that the music repeated from number one in the listening guide to number four. In other words, the entire part A, theme one, theme two, theme three, and the closing section were all repeated, but not in an exact repetition. There were a number of changes, which I hope you noticed and enjoyed. I'd like to point out just one of them. When theme one repeats, everything is pretty much going as it did the first time we encountered it. But as theme one ends and proceeds to theme two, instead of giving us one loud short note as he did before, Chopin gives us a growling trill in the bass register. A trill is a rapid alternation between two adjacent pitches, da 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 except much faster than I can sing it. Here is the trill in isolation in the music. And now let's listen to it in context. I'll start the recording where the music goes back to number one in the listening guide. We'll encounter theme one being played and repeated with a couple subtle changes. On the first pass, we'll again get that humorous loud single note, but 
The second time, we'll get the trill instead. Make some physical gesture when we get to the trill that now leads into theme two. Finally, we've arrived at part B, and it begins with a lovely contrast to part A. Again, we have three themes in part B, four, five, and six. Here's theme four at number six in the listening guide. The second chord of theme four is such a wonderful, effective surprise. It gets me every time. Such a beautiful, unexpected chord. Let's listen to just the first two chords, and I'll stop the music right there after the second chord so that you can savor the memory of it for at least a moment. As is often the case with any great idea, the idea is worth repeating. And Chopin does just that a few seconds later. The entire theme four repeats, beginning with those two chords. I'll start the music the first time theme four occurs. Raise your eyebrows or whatever when you perceive that theme four is repeating. It's not going to be identical. So be prepared to enjoy noticing the changes. And now for theme five, mentioned at number seven in the listening guide. It's a fast waltz, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, based on a three note descending pattern. Da, 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 one, two, three. Let's listen. Theme five starts out in the key of C-sharp minor, but just before theme six starts, Chopin gives us one chord toward the end of this passage that propels us into a major key. Listen to theme five once more and gesture when you detect that chord, which creates an instantaneous modulation, as we say.
Theme six at number eight in the listening guide is a wild flight of fancy. I'm going to start the music right at that chord, which propels us into a major key and on to theme six. takes a lot of practice to play theme six. A favorite detail in theme six for me is a pair of sudden accents on the second beat of the measure. We're flying along, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and suddenly he goes, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. See if you notice this exciting rhythmic event when it happens. Again, signal me with some kind of physical gesture. These unexpected accents are to be enjoyed. At number nine in the listening guide, there's a question mark. It says the music now repeats from number blank to number blank. If you wrote this composition, well, what might you choose to repeat now? Did I hear one of you say, how about themes four, five, and six? You know, to create some symmetry in part B with what I did in part A. And if that's what you said, you'd be right. You're thinking and solving musical problems like a composer. So the listening guides numbers six, seven, and eight, denoting themes four, five, six, will be repeated. But you might want to change some aspects. There's a big change right off the bat. Let's see if you notice what it is. I'm going to start the music at number six in the listening guide, the first time we encounter theme four. Then the music will jump to when it repeats at number nine in the guide. What's different? And the answer, of course, is it's much louder, bolder. And Chopin instructs the pianist in the musical score to make that dynamic adjustment. Perceiving the dynamic levels, the constant changes in loudness and softness in music is another thing that we want to be keenly aware of as listeners. When we listen to the scherzo all the way through again, be listening for other changes when themes four, five, and six repeat in part B. At number 10, in the listening guide, it says theme six undergoes some dramatic alterations. So let's listen to theme six on its repeat journey in part B, just before Chopin begins to alter it at number 10. And what Chopin is preparing us for with all of that is what he's about to do to theme, well, you tell me. At number 11 in the listening guide, there's a blank to fill in. The only hint I'll give you is it's one of the part B themes, four, five, or six. Here's the music from number 11 in the listening guide.
It was, of course, theme five, our melancholy waltz. Ya -da -da, la -da -da, now being played in a number of different keys, one after the other. And at number 12 in the listening guide, Chopin will bring back a theme from part A. Our choices, of course, from part A are one, two, or three. And just in case you don't remember them, here's a quick review of all three themes from part A in Reader's Digest condensed form. <laughs> So which one of those, one, two, or three, is making a wild cameo appearance here at number 12 in the listening guide? And the winner is theme two, our bipolar theme. Well, we've already listened from number 13 in the listening guide to number 14, much earlier this evening, when I asked you to acknowledge when part B ended and part A returned and I played that joke on you and introduced the Polonaise into this. So that leaves us with just to fill in the blanks at number 15. Which two themes make brief appearances in the coda or special ending? So without further ado, here is the coda. And Chopin is famous for his scintillating codas. Which two of the six themes do you find here? We began with a paraphrase of theme two, which was then interrupted by fragmentary echoes of theme one, the loop, the loop, the loop, the loop. And he concluded by returning to the theme two material. Well, before we listen to Xiong Jin Cho play this once again, let me remind you that the more we perceive, the more we receive, the more musical information we notice as we listen, the more emotional pleasure we can receive from listening. So when we're finally able to go to concerts again, stay focused in the music itself. Don't read the program notes while we're performing for you. Each moment you spend reading, you're missing vital musical information from the composer that just passes us by but once in real time. I'll be back on January 30th with Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto. In the meantime, please visit NJ Pack in your living room and also the Discovery Orchestra at discoveryorchestra.org. Um, before we do this though, if there are any questions, I'd like to just take a brief look at the question uh, and answer panel. And um, no open questions is what it says right now. Uh, maybe you haven't been able to do it yet, but if you have any uh, at this time, or have I just, uh, no questions or comments that you've seen? Okay, well, <laughs> maybe I've just uh, com completely uh, brought you into a, a space of uh, unspeaking or unthinking or something. But in any event, let's listen again now to the entire um, scherzo once again, played by Xiong Jin Chou. Mm -hmm. 